was actually scouting for some data science program and then I got to know there was very few uh, uh, <coughs> players who were actually giving this uh, PGP full time program and uh, it, it just was one of those. scalable cloud-based digital infrastructure and modular solutions powered by Amazon Web Services. No need to deal with several vendors and deploy their silo systems resulting in higher cost, inefficiency, and security risk. Crowdsourced best practices for running a higher education institution. Design. Design perfect courses with the help of AI tool and big data analysis suiting to industry demand. Get insight about skill and job
Kishore, can we start? Priyan? Rajat, good morning to you. Can you kindly unmute yourself, please, Rajat? This yes. is uh, Vinay Kulkarni here. I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Can you hear me? Start uh, without any further delay. Uh, <clears throat> let me start with apologies for the slightly late uh, start to this particular session. Um, obviously, it was because uh, the opening plenary session took some time. So, welcome everyone and uh, uh, good morning to you. Uh, after the tone set by the speakers in the plenary session, we are now entering into very specific talks, which uh, I think are going to be extremely interesting. So uh, without any fur further ado, let me introduce to you uh, the first speaker for the first session today, that is uh, Rajat Monga. He's going to talk on uh, AI is changing the world. Why is it taking so long? Uh, Rajat is the co-founder and former lead of uh, TensorFlow, uh, and he was part of the Google Brain team that powers uh, machine learning research and products worldwide. Uh, as a founding, founding member of the team, he was involved in co-designing and co-implementing this belief and many more, uh, and more recently, TensorFlow. Prior to this deal, he led teams in Azure, took out the engineering teams and co-designed web scale crawling and content matching infrastructure at Attributor and co-implemented and scaled eBay's search engine. Uh, Rajat uh, has a B.Tech degree in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of uh, Technology, Delhi. And he has recently left Google to bring machine learning into some key aspects of the business world. Uh, it would be very interesting to listen to you, Rajit. Uh, uh, Rajat. Uh, it's all yours. The stage is yours. Uh, please go ahead. You have about uh, 40 minutes to talk on. Uh, don't mind if I ring a bell or two just to remind you about the time, and then we'll get into the question answers. This is Vinay Kulkarni here from Egypt. Yeah. Th thanks, Dr. Vinay Kulkarni. Thank you for that introduction, and a pleasure to be here today. So, uh, you know, we hear a lot about AI, and of course, this whole session is really about AI. There are so many different things that we look at. So, you know, we've heard of so many amazing things that AI has been doing over the last few years. So first, I'll go a little bit into that. And then beyond that, wanted to see what are some of the things slowing us down and why aren't we really getting to where we want to be in every place across the board, right? And how can we help? And so let's take a look first on, uh, you know, where's, where are we with machine learning so far, which is sort of the biggest piece of AI that's really made things uh, move forward currently. And, uh, you know, the first piece here, one of the early pieces is vision. And, you know, if you think about where deep learning came from, that field itself is very uh, old and it's been, you know, neural networks have been around for 30, 40 years now, maybe longer. Uh, but it's over the last 10 years that we've seen this huge resurgence. And one of the earliest things that we saw that come with was vision for a number of good reasons. So, uh, you know, one of the data sets that, that everybody talks about and some of the numbers that I'll talk about is based on this thing called ImageNet, which is basically uh, the core data set is about a million images across a thousand different categories. And these are categories like not just, you know, cat and dog, but very specialized kinds of cats and very specialized kinds of dogs, something that even humans are not amazing at. You know, they don't get it right every time. So let's take a look at where we were back in 2011 when some of this, this resurgence started, this sort of second innings in some sense. And back in 2011, humans for this particular data set were at 5% errors. So, you know, we didn't get everything right. Out of 100, we would get about five wrong. Uh, whereas Computers at that point were in 26% errors, and this is you know after making a lot of improvements and stuff. And so, we're still far behind where computers were back then. Now move forward. This is sort of like looking at this you know some image of an animal that you can kind of make out. You know, as a human, you can probably guess it's like a cheetah, but it's hard for a computer to guess that. Uh, move forward a little bit, and we can see you know it goes from there to basically 3% errors in just a few years. And what this led to was really kind of like back in the old days when, uh, you know, millions of years ago, really, in, in the progression of Earth and human or animals on Earth, 
where you suddenly had vision and you saw like this plethora of different kinds of creatures come up. And so this was a great you know, move forward. And let's see you know, what this led to in a couple of areas. So, so one, Google Photos, which uh, now is pretty much you know, this kind of technology is really in every place, every application. And you expect it to be there. You don't really want to organize photos and think about labeling them in every way. That's just done for you. In this case, you can just search for dogs or pictures of, you know, uh, here's an amazing picture of a glacier back there. Um, the other, you know, side of things is, of course, you know, vision is one. The other piece that works really well for us is hearing. And uh, once again, this is something that computers were really bad at back then. And so, you know, in terms of the improvements that happened over time, we can actually, you know, not just can we type in those things, but we can just ask our phone if you show me pictures of cats and it will show you a whole bunch of pictures because it gets that, that speech. Uh, now, just to give you a perspective on how much deep learning changed things here back in 2012, the launch of you know, change from the existing model to this, this new model with deep learning, the gain that we got there uh, was equivalent to something like 20 years of research by all of the speech community combined. So all of that, by this one change. And that's really you know, what spread, the, spread up the improvements in this, this area among others as well. Uh, you know, what this led to is this is a you know, product that's launched, I, I believe earlier this year, where you can actually live caption any video right on your phone. And you know, in this case, this person uh, has a cooking video, maybe you can't really hear there. And what this does is it basically just turns on the live captioning, you can see everything written down right there, live. Um, you know, of course, these are probably two speakers that you're familiar with, you know, whether it's Alexa or Google Home. And uh, these speakers really came about primarily because of this huge change, where we are changing from this mode of typing and everything to really asking for, for things that we care about, and we are starting to get really good answers for those. Um, now, number three there is, of course, you know, the vision and speech are great, but really understanding language. So even when we talk to a computer, uh, you know, one of the key pieces is, does it really understand that language and what can we do with it? And it's not just for speech, of course, it's also for something as basic as a search that you do or do some, you know, anywhere across your chats, et cetera, et cetera. So, so in this case, um, you know, one similar data set that, we've, that has been used, sort of a competition that's been used to track progress for, uh, humans or, or these models versus humans as this reading comprehension test. And this was created a few years ago, 2018, not that far ago, right? And uh, where humans had a score of you know, 86 in this or an F1 score of 89, it took us a couple of years, not, not very long, where we now have models that do better on reading comprehension on the specific test than humans itself. So think about it this way. If you had an exam and you could have this model actually go through all the stuff that you were supposed to read, it would probably do better than the average human there. Uh, of course, I don't think it's gonna be available for most of you, especially if you're students. I think you'll still have to do the learning for now. Uh, so now looking at what impact that's had in, you know, in this short span really, this is an example of what was happening in Google search before and after for a more complex query where you're asking for a specific thing. The first one was really just taking those keywords and trying to put those together and match documents that have all those keywords. Whereas now it actually understands the specific intent here in terms of traveler from Brazil to the US, visa needed for them, the right kind of tourists. And putting all of that together really makes a big difference. And we've made a huge leap in how we understand language now. So, you know, we've talked about these three different domains and let's take a look at how it's been impacting different kinds of products. Uh, you know, one, again, going back to translation, here you have right on your phone, Google Translate can actually detect the language, convert it to your language from a picture. So it's basically recognizing that there's text, doing optical character recognition to recognize what text it is, what language it is, and then convert translating it to your language and then displaying it with AR. And, not only is it in that application, it's also integrated into a bunch of other, you know, you can access it on most Android phones today. Here's an example with WhatsApp where you can translate like a non-language translator or understand different languages as well. Really allowing us to communicate across boundaries, across different kinds of places as well. 
Here's an example of you know, combining a number of technologies around vision where uh, it's always hard when you're trying to take a group picture to get everybody aligned and stuff. And in this case, with the photo booth, it's just figuring out, you turn it on, it's gonna figure out when everybody is aligned and what, when's the right time to take that picture and take it for you right there. And finally, you know, here are a bunch of hardware products that Google launched last year. And pretty much every single one of them has machine learning being used in different kinds of ways. You know, on the phone, of course, uh, you know, for, cam for the camera itself, for lots of other things, for the hearing part, you know, using OK Google and a number of other things and so on, really across the board for every single piece. Um, you know, we talked about a number of applications. One, one that's really close to us for that really impacts our lives is healthcare, which, which really changes how we do things. And there are a couple of areas that we've made a lot of progress there as well. Uh, this one is in terms of, you know, just really understanding how things are in eyes. And these are pictures of the back of our eyes called fundus images or fundal images. Um, and here it's trying to detect diabetic retinopathy in patients. Turns out it's a very common disease, especially in places like India. And often there, you know, folks across the board don't have access to the doctors. And so being able to detect this, and in this case, turns out this model can do actually much better than most doctors can. So you can uh, you know, ship this to all kinds of places and really scale the access to doctors to lots more people. And of course, something that's much closer to us today, with COVID-19, there have been lots of things that are happening. And AI has been really at the forefront of helping scale, scale up things and really make progress in what we can do. In this case, a company in India called Cure AI has basically been uh, able to look at chest images and really help you diagnose if the patient has COVID-19, what's the risk for them, et cetera, independent of some of the other tests as well. And so something that we're seeing right in use right today and really makes a big difference for us. So, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of things that AI has enabled. Now to think about what kind of things are we, um, what's really happened over these past years that's really allowed us to grow this? You know, of course there've been improvements in the hardware itself, improvements in algorithms as well. But beyond that, there are a number of other things that are needed as well. And one of them I believe is tools. You know, in this case, uh, here's a hammer. If you wanna do something, you know, if you have a hammer, you basically think of everything as a nail. And so you are basically gonna be hammering every single thing. And you're li often limited by what you can do by the tools that you have. So let's go back a little bit and see how things were a few years ago. Uh, you know, back when we started 2011 timeframe, NumPy was still very common from a Python perspective. And if you wanted to do MNIST, which is sort of this really small machine learning for vision examples, yeah. that we just did yeah. for lots and lots of years, which basically has 60,000 images of just characters, zero to nine, and it's trying to address yeah. yeah. Now, just to do these images, basically, it needed to, uh, you know, here's how you set up it. So this is page one of that, of the code that you have keep going, you know, you really define not just the, the basics, define your parameters, define your functions, uh, define your actual function for the, you know, defining the layers and so on, what it does. And you don't stop there, right? You have to, because there's no automatic um, back propagation or whatever, you, you actually have to specify the gradients that are there. In fact, when I started in this field, this is sort of where we were. And uh, now this is the training itself. You're going through all of this, you know, this, ends up being something like six pages of code that you have to write just to get that MNIST example going. And think about all the errors that you have, all the time that you spend in just fixing that code. This is really the state was just 10 years ago, not, not that long ago. And in fact, you know, here, if uh, you're familiar with the person here, Jeffrey Hinton, who won the Turing Award about a year ago for deep learning, he's very you know, well known as the father of deep learning, he, he, along with uh, Jan LeCun and, um, Yasha Benjo had won the Turing Award. He's been responsible for a lot of research improvements in this area, and he's been at it for the last 20, 30 years. For him, the tool of choice was MATLAB. And most of the time he was playing with that one MNIST example in MATLAB, you know, and that was his tool of choice. And but he was able to make a lot of progress on that over the years uh, because he really understood that well. And he was looking at a very small problem in some sense. Now move forward a little bit, and you know, this is one of those networks that really changed the game for vision in uh, leveraging deep learning. This was created back in 2012 by a person called Alex Krzyzewski working with Ilya Satskever and Jeffrey Hinton himself. And this was 
uh, you know, fondly called AlexNet after him uh, later. And this was, you know, he designed it by hand using a very custom tool, handwritten tool that took advantage of GPUs that were starting to be available. Now, GPUs initially were basically graphics processing units. They're there in pretty much every computer that you see, mostly to drive your screen. And they were used in high-end graphics stations and so on. And what he was able to do was really program them to do all the computation that this was, need, was needed for this, really speed things up. And so, so all of that custom work really allowed him to make progress from you know, where things were, improve things by something like 20% on that ImageNet example. This was the first time that uh, you know, instead of doing that handcrafted features in Vision, we were starting to see deep learning make a huge difference. Now, move forward a couple of years um, and this, if you know, if you think about the, the last one that had maybe 10, 20 layers, this one has each box there is sort of a layer, and so something like 100 layers, and you know, stacked like 20, 30 of them with all kinds of different things. Uh, this network is called Inception, and this was sort of the the next generation in some sense uh, after AlexNet, which gave another significant jump in improvements on that uh, vision example, and this was built. Uh, with a tool called Disbelief that we built back at Google back in 2011, 2012 timeframe. And having that tool really allowed this person, uh, Christian Zegedy, to really be able to build this and try this out because he needed to run this across lots and lots of machines. He ran, uh, I don't know, hundreds of experiments across each of them, across maybe tens to hundreds of machines. And this could only be done because there was a tool available. Um, moving forward again, you know, this is uh, for language models. And here we have, uh, you know, BERT versus OpenAI's uh, GPT. And these were built, you know, this huge improvement, you know, BERT was one of the significant jumps in natural language itself that allowed us to really beat that squad benchmark that we were talking about. And we've been, people have been building on top of that. That was enabled by having yeah. TensorFlow, which was in some oh. sense, next generation platform after this belief that we built at Google to allow, and in fact, natural language was one of the areas that uh, uh, really inspired us to push things and, and move things forward. Now, if you keep going, you know, going back to that same MNIST example that we were talking about, that this is that same example doing the exact same thing, and you can now write it in just one page of code, you know, just this little bit. So if you think about all the little things that you have not have to worry about, Think about what more can you do now that that has been simplified. And this is possible because of TensorFlow 2.0 that came out last year. So going across just 10 years, we've seen this huge improvement from a tool's perspective in terms of what you can do in terms of pushing the research forward in deep learning. Now that's great, uh, but beyond the research, there's a lot more that you can do. You know, If you wanna build a house, just a hammer is not gonna be enough. You maybe need a drill, maybe you need a bunch of other things as well. And so if you think about the say, taking that analogy, going back to machine learning, we often think about the machine learning, the ML code, where we're building a model as sort of the key piece. But that, that's sort of just one part of the thing. You know, in addition to that piece, that box that we were just talking about so far, uh, we have all of these other boxes that you really have to worry about for, for making things work end to end. Because if you, once you have the model, you still want the deploy to production. Before that, there are a whole bunch of things that you need to do. And to do this consistently across the businesses, across you know, the world that you, in all the things that you want to do, having all these pieces is still a big deal. And so um, you know, for that, we have something called TensorFlow Extended. And uh, here, the idea is to have you know, all of these pieces that we were looking at in the last graph, really put all these pieces together and uh, you know, solve them for you. And a number of these pieces are now available in open source along with the code. Itself. And so I'll go through each of these pieces and just show you what they do. Uh, so, you know, in this, the first piece is for data validation and something called TensorFlow data validation. And what that helps you with is uh, really, you know, all of these pieces that you're looking at, the first piece being, you know, once you get data, you want to really understand what that looks like as you're building the model. Uh, so you decide what kind of model do you want to build, how many parameters you want, et cetera, et cetera. So the first piece there is to compute those statistics and just show them to you across those different fields. In this case, you can do that pretty easily from the data and the, whatever form it's coming. You can see this visualization as well. Now, once you have that visualization and you have a got, gotten the basic idea, you can get, you want a schema that you're gonna work off of to build your model. 
And this does that for you as well. It infers the basic schema that you can then you know, work on. Uh, like in this case, it looks at all of these fields, says this one's a floating point, this one's an int, this one's a string, and you probably want to treat it this way and so on. Um, and then you know, once you've done all of those, now you have a schema, you want to make sure that all the data really follows that or matches that. And if not, maybe you want to iterate on that and so on. And so the next piece is, once you have those stats, you can take those stats in the schema and you can visualize the stats comparing two parts of your data to see how well they are looking. And you know, here we are visualizing for two different days. This particular example is a Chicago taxi uh, data set, which basically has a pricing and so on for different uh, days in, in Chicago. And uh, you know, in this case, we talked about you know day one and day two. In addition to just visualizing that, it also validates those by really comparing those along with the schema and uh, surfacing any anomalies, anything that seems odd, anything that's changed over time, because you want to think about how you want to model that in a good way. Um, now, once you've done all of these, that's great. You're good to go in terms of training the model. Now, the other piece that often comes, how do you really know that the data that you're training on is the same that you're serving with? You typically assume that that's the case, uh, but are you really sure? And so this is something that can help with in terms of when you're serving, it can also validate statistics while serving and doing it in a very efficient manner. So it makes sure that you are really serving and training on the same data set. And to give you an example, here's an area where here's a you know, product Google Play that you probably have on your Android phone if you use Android, where you know, we recommend applications that you should be looking at if you want to download the next thing when you go there. And for this recommender system, there are a lot of pieces that go in there and we have personalized recommendations for you. Um, now, one of the things that happened is, okay, we, we built a model and deployed it, that things were going great. But when we started to look and compare the data between the training, the serving and the training, turned out that it wasn't quite the same. And the tool that we built for this, in this case, data validation, showed us a huge difference. In fact, just by fixing that one thing, we got a 2% lift on that particular case. Uh, if you just spend the same kind of time in building the model or improving the model, you would have probably taken way longer. So, you know, when you hear that, uh, looking at the data and understanding that and improving that makes a big difference, that is probably the number one thing. Once you have a basic model working, I mean, that, that's really the number one thing that you should make sure your data is in good shape. And that this really helps you with this. Now, the next piece, once you've validated the data and looked at that is to, uh, transform it in the right form for your modeling to, to work. And here we have TrendsFlow Transform, which really helps you there. And it, it serves a couple of purposes. So first, let's look at what it allows you to do. Uh, <clears throat> so you have these input features or input data elements that you want to transform to build the right kind of features for your model that you're trying to build here. And uh, you know, once you have that, that's basically that those functions are basically analyzed to create what we call a graph. TensorFlow internally uses graph, but TensorFlow 2.0, you don't think about graphs, but internally it still uses those. And the good thing about those graphs is it allows you to use those same graphs under the covers, both for trading and serving, and you don't have to worry about it. Right? And so when we're talking about the serving, training serving skill, this is really helping you take care of that as well automatically under the covers. And so here's an example of some pre-processing function, what you might do in terms of creating those features. Here we are you know, scaling one of the inputs, uh, converting, taking a string input and map mapping it to an integer for a particular vocabulary, and in some cases, bucketizing those. And here's a, sort of some examples of the kind of thing, kind of transformations that you can do in terms of uh, just scaling, uh, doing a bag of words or ingram mapping and so on, uh, basically taking a vocabulary and strings and mapping it to sort of a, uh, uh, buckets uh, in the right sizes and so on. And finally, you know, crossing different kinds of features, so combining two, two different kinds of features and so on. Uh, and then you can also, in fact, sometimes what you want is the feature for one model might be the output of another model itself. And you can do that here as well. Uh, so we covered the, the input processing part. And then of course you come to the, 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 the training itself. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this uh, you know, this is a whole thing by itself. But here we basically support using the KS model in an easy manner, which is well integrated with TensorFlow overall. And, uh, you know, here's basically build the model once you save it. Now, once you've saved that model through KS, you can really use it in the rest of the pieces as well. 
And uh, now once you have that model that you've built and you've trained, uh, which is often where you spend a lot of time in early on, but over time, the goal is to have that be just one part of it because you really want to solve all of these different pieces. And now you look, you want to look at evaluating that model. You know, often while training, you look at the overall value. And so, you know, uh, where you'll see, is the model accurate enough overall, some top level number or some loss number, et cetera, that you're looking at. And once you have that, you, you typically think, okay, let's go on, let's deploy this and so on. Now it turns out there's a lot more that you can do. So here, uh, we just you know give that model to this model analysis tool and run that. And of course, the first thing it shows is, okay, what's that overall metric? It's showing the overall accuracy, overall AUC score, et cetera, the different kinds of things that you might do. And here's the baseline as well that it's comparing. Now, uh, that's great. But how about different areas? Is the model really performing the same across all the slices? So let's take a look. In this case, you know, we say, okay, let's slice those metrics by a specific spec. And uh, in this case, we are looking by, you know, this has different hours. So you can go all the way from like 12 a.m. or 1 a.m. to all the way to 23. And it's basically slicing by that and trying to see is the score, is the model as good across the day or is it doing differently across different? As we look at it, we can see that it's very different. We can now sort and look at and try to really understand the model better. Maybe the data in some areas is not, it's much smaller. Maybe it's optimized for the hours that just have a lot more data, et cetera, right? And so just going through this often surfaces some very interesting insights, especially when you go from one model to the next, you wanna make sure that maybe you're making the overall model better on average but you're not hurting a certain style of customer or a, a lot more than others. You really want to be very careful about that, both from a, a biasing perspective, you might not have really have any customers if you do that. And so covering the customers that matter the most for you, optimizing the right way, this, this, this kind of slicing really allows you to dig into those. Uh, you know, there are more things that you can look at as well, the distribution across that, the, the precision recall curve in, along those slices as well. And uh, now you have a model, you validated that it's doing great. So what do you do with that? Now you probably want to serve it. You want to run it across the data and you, you know, uh, want to query it for lots of new uh, instances or examples while you're serving. And to simplify that piece that, you know, scaling it up can be hard. Sometimes there are a number of things that you want to think about and to do support you with that is uh, something called TensorFlow Serving where you can take that model and just run the server that's pre-built for you if you want. And, and uh, just run that on the port and if you're up and running, you can make queries to this at this point. You can, here's a very simple Python example that basically creates a proto buffer, sends that as a query to this and gets back results. And you can do that at a fairly high scale. You can scale it up many different ways and stuff. Uh, you know, you can also have a timeout and other batching and so on that, that makes sense for your examples. Now, you know, maybe this, in this case, we're using proto buffers, but maybe you use more used to the REST APIs and that's what the rest of your systems use. And so you can do that as well. Here's a REST API that you could use. And to get that started, all you need to change is instead of the, the basic port, just say REST API port and you can start serving this. Uh, here's an example using curl that just runs that and gets back some JSON results for you. So uh, really trying to simplify all the way from data to, to serving itself. And now to really put all the pieces that we talked about together, here's going from starting from the tensor, from the training data itself, we validate that data, look through the, you know, generate the schema, validate, you know, identify any kind of anomalies, et cetera, over time, make any kind of transformations on the data itself. Uh, then once we have that transformed data and that graph, which can be used both for training and serving, we go to the, the modeling itself, leverage Keras model to build out and train these models. Save that model, make sure it's good before we deploy it, and then we deploy it. And so we, we support really that entire life cycle. And in fact, in this case, we talk about once you've served the model, you probably want to log those outputs, log both the inputs and the outputs. So those logs can go back in terms of data validation, uh, making sure there are no SKUs, et cetera. Also making, you know, going back to merging with the training data so you can continue improving the model itself. So we looked at all of these pieces, you know, that, that are available. In fact, 
uh, those are available in open source today, so you can uh, try them out. You can use them. There are a number of other pieces as well that are coming over time. And um, you know, if you if you are a person who likes bowling, this is the kind of picture that you want to you know see while you're bowling. And this is really what experts can do with bowling, where they get you know a strike every time. Pretty amazing. But it turns out, you know, most people are not that good, and you might get strikes once in a while. If I go out there, I get a couple of strikes in the game. I'm happy. Uh, that's basically what I get. But um, it, you know, a lot of people actually what they get is this: a gutter ball. They're, they're missing everything, and that's sort of the difference between what experts can do and what typical folks can do with machine learning today. You know, experts can really get the get things right today, uh, but it's still really hard to get this. You know. To, to make all of that work end to end. And that's, this is where we often end up. So what, what you know, TensorFlow Extended is really meant to be is really to provide you know, what you see here and even allow you know, beginners to really get those, all of those things right, really be the guardrails for machine learning where you can make things work right every single time. So, so that's you know, one area that I think is uh, valuable in terms of how we can make improvements, how we can really include and make AI accessible to a lot more people and really see that you know, change the world as we, we wanted it to be. Now, uh, before I go, I did want to just look ahead a little bit and give you some examples of where we are heading in terms of you know, newer things, et cetera. You probably heard of some of those, but you know, some good and some uh, interesting challenges that we also have to think about as we go ahead. And so, you know, here an example of you know what an Amazon Go store. Uh, now a number of other companies are building these as well. And the idea here is, you have a card, just go and just walk into the store. You know, just swipe the card and go and pick up whatever you want. And there's no checkout. You just pick it up and go out, and you'll be charged for it. And the way they do it is they combine a whole bunch of technology, including vision to understand somebody's picked it up, to track who is picking what up, and so on. Then you go out really automatically and figure out that you are the person who picked that up and so charging you the right way for that. And, and a whole bunch of these technologies are coming together to make this possible. Uh, you'll start to see more and more of these where you don't really need people to be around to check you out, et cetera, especially in the kind of scenario we are in today with COVID-19. This really starts to make a lot of sense. Um, another example that we talk about all the time, of course, autonomous driving. We would love to see this today uh, or yesterday, in fact. But I mean, if we're not quite there, although we have lots of examples going around all over the place, here's an example from Waymo, a group, you know, an alphabet company, as you're probably familiar, that basically at the bottom, you see these pictures of what it sees. And at the top, it's, it's view combining all the 3D data or the vision data to recognize what's going on, et cetera. And making these very hard turns, you know, in this case, uh, going left, where somebody's really coming in front and so on and tracking, being able to do all of this. We're making huge progress in this area because of deep learning. So these are two examples where things are, you know, getting a lot, making so much, uh, you know, improvements over the last few years. Now here's a different at example. Least not, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. It's time when we need to rely on. So, you know, that looks like Barack Obama, so, sounds like Barack Obama, but as you saw in that video, it's some person impersonating as Barack Obama and really putting whatever words he wants in that mouth. This technology is available for lots of people today for using in all kinds of ways. And it's tricky because, you know, in this case, of course, it's just an experiment to show that this is problematic, but people can use it for real things. Some good, some not so good and some borderline and depends on how you think about it. Here's an example from the Indian context. So this is the original video for this politician who many of you are probably familiar with. And uh, you know, during elections last year, what they did was take this video and and really translate that in, into many different local languages. So it appears more personal. And this is actually a very, um, I mean, to me, it seems like it's a perfectly fine legitimate thing to do. And it's not, uh, you know, it is 
with this person uh, wanting to do this. It's not somebody else doing this. And so, you know, it's a place, it's a way to amplify what you can do into many other, in many other ways. But there are lots of other negative ways that this can be used as well. So as we improve this technology, it's, it's worthwhile to think about how this can be used and how do we use it in a good way. And so with that, I, I really, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do. The technology has been improving really rapidly and continues to do so. The tools are making it easier for you to build things with this. And, you know, in terms of what you can do, of course, the sky's the limit. It's really limited by what you are, uh, what, what you think of, just as it says. And I would like to really leave you with what you want to do with this. And uh, would love, also love to see all the kinds of amazing things that you build with this. Thank you, Rajat. I think um, <clears throat> you, you, you have a few more minutes. Uh, you took much less time than, uh, than uh, you are allotted. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I have, I have time. No worries. <laughs> okay, so uh, for the participants, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think the best way out is to type them out in the chat window, and I will uh, pick them up from there. Uh, but being the moderator, I think I have the privilege of starting off with the questions myself. So, Rajat, here are some questions. I think yeah. you know, in your talk, you dealt a lot, or you dwelt a lot on uh, uh, you know validation of data as well as interpretation of uh, results. Can we have AI or ML do that automatically? I mean, the other way of asking question is, how far away are we from not having to understand mathematics and statistics and the algorithms to really start using AI? Yeah, so, so there, is, there is definitely a lot of progress happening in that area as well, um, what we call auto ML, where we are automating not just the, the training, where, we, where it started was, okay, can we just automate all the tuning that you have to do in terms of building the model? What model do you want to build, et cetera? Starting there and slowly expanding in terms of, okay, can we really understand the data? Can we automatically clean up parts of it or at least flag the right things so that somebody else can look at it and stuff. And I think over time we've made a lot of progress. I definitely see us heading more in that direction. Um, I think where things become, um, I would say, we would want to combine that with the right kind of developers as we are building the right applications on, on what do we want to do? How do we put together the right pieces for this to be automated like the, the key piece and really think about the, the business case for this. What is it, you know, how does it really help what we are trying to solve for rather than focusing on the, okay, the nitty gritties of the math. I, I think in some ways, you know, tools like TensorFlow took away the math, took away things about the gradients or the algebra and so on and all of that. Uh, with this automation, we are taking away some more pieces where, you know, the data cleaning or more of the understanding that you need to do. Um, and which is useful because that allows, that makes it accessible, not just to, uh, you know, every researcher or say a data scientist, but to every developer out there and, you know, maybe hopefully even beyond. Well, thanks, uh, Rajat. Uh, another question, a uh, quick one from me itself is, uh, when we still talk about uh, <clears throat> two kinds of uh, people involved in developing uh, solutions. The person who understands the domain and the person who understands uh, ML and the math behind it. Uh, <clears throat> again, the question here is, uh, it's very difficult to combine these two skills and it yeah. requires people to collaborate. And mm -hmm. that perhaps was the reason why things like expert systems fell off long back. So again, what is your view on this? How, yeah. how, how far away from we, from directly using the tools as a domain expert and not having to understand math again? Yes, yes. I, I mean, that, that is exactly the right direction to go. That, that's what I would love to see. And that's where uh, I, you know, that's what I work on as well. I, you know, over time, I think we're building the right set of uh, steps. We are, you know, building the steps in the scaffolding, really, we've done that the base layer in some sense, and we're building the layers on top to allow us to do that. I think over the next few years, we'll start to see this in more specific domains to start with, where uh, the experts or the domain experts can leverage machine learning. Uh, we'll start to see more applications that leverage machine learning behind the covers. So if you are uh, used to things, so let's say you know Excel is a tool that lots of people do. Now they are used to certain kinds of functions, but a number of more things can be integrated into that to really help you where you don't think that that's machine learning, but that, that really simplifies what you're trying to do. 
Another example that comes to mind is there's this uh, company that I saw recently. Traditionally, if you think about something like uh, photo editing, you know, where you had to really mark pixel by pixel and sort of go through and, and define things that here's the part that I want to color differently and so on. Now, what they've done is they use machine learning to segment the image automatically. And instead of you saying, okay, these are the pixels they want, you just say, okay, I want to replace this person or I want to change the hair color or, you know, because it's identifying all those pieces and making that logical. So from a domain perspective, you don't need to understand how the pixels work. If you're an artist, you can really work at the level you think at. And that's, I think, something that we need to see in different kinds of areas over time. I think we'll probably go more domain by domain, although uh, the underlying technology is also slowly moving up the stack to make it easier. Okay, I think we have a stream of questions as you might have expected. So let me go through the audience question one by one. Uh, we have about uh, eight minutes now. Uh, <clears throat> so the first question is, uh, you cover tens TensorFlow as a tool. When is it the right time to switch to new tools or focus on basic algo? <laughs> um, so it depends on what you're trying to do, right? If there, there's a, a trade-off of, if you have a tool, you're going to do everything that the tool allows you to do. You know, we talked about the hammer. You basically can hammer anything. So even if you have a screw, you're basically be hammering it in the, into the wall. Um, now, often that does work. You know, things like TensorFlow are very um, generic in that they, depending on the level that you're looking at, if you're looking at very high level, maybe it provides packages for certain things. As you go deeper down, it probably allows you to do more things and control more things in a different way. That, that said, maybe there are places where, you know, if you're doing cutting edge research and you really want to play with some very, very specific things, like maybe you want a tool that's really focused on that kind of research. Uh, you know, there are tools that either build on top of TensorFlow or PyTorch or something else focused on say natural language. And maybe that's the kind of tool that you want to use if that's the research that you're doing. Or sometimes you actually want to say, you know what, I don't even want the basics that you have. I really want to play with the math myself and really look at all those things. And then maybe even going back to the lowest level tools like NumPy or well, maybe you know something like TensorFlow or PyTorch are still better because they can accelerate things with GPUs, but say MATLAB or something might be simpler. And so yes, picking the right tool for the, the piece is, is definitely important. And uh, uh, TensorFlow, while it, it is uh, very general and allows you to do a whole bunch of things, which is helpful in certain cases, if there's a very specific piece that you want to do, sometimes there's a better tool for doing just that. Okay, thanks, Rajat. Uh, one related question, since we are already on TensorFlow from uh, Monica Rudra, uh, where are we on integrating Spark with TensorFlow? Um, there are, depending on what you're trying to do, there are a number of integrations already existing. So you can, uh, the easiest is if you want to run inference or make predictions on data that lives, you know, that, that you are sort of uh, processing with Spark, you can do that pretty easily. There's a bunch of integrations available for that. Um, if you want to train a model, that training piece is sort of independent. The Spark, Spark has a very different model than what uh, TensorFlow uses. Mm -hmm. So you probably can't just use Spark for that. You would probably want to use tra TensorFlow's training or distributed training for that. Uh, in terms of data access, you can access, uh, there's integration for accessing Spark data frames and stuff. Uh, and a number of things that there's, there's been a lot of progress on. So I would say just look for that. And, I think most of the things that you want to do are probably available today. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now here is something which uh, you know you showed and which also impacts us positively on a day-to-day -day basis. How do we address deep fake? Can we use the uh, uh, <clears throat> you know? So in general, the question is how do we address deep fake? Yep. And, and I mean that's exactly the the example that I I showed and. Um, you know, there are lots of negative uses of that being done uh, today. It's a hard one. It's it's one of those things where the technology allows you to use it in both good ways and bad ways. Can we use the same or similar technology to detect some of those? Yes, there's a lot of work happening in there. There's research happening to separate out, you know, deep fakes from real videos as well. And I think we'll make progress there. But that said, it's sort of a cat and mouse game. If you think about things like, you know, whether it's email scam or, or security, et cetera. Yes, you make improvements in catching all the existing things, but uh, uh, folks who really care about getting around it would also come up with new, new ideas as well. So 
Um, I, I don't think there's a perfect answer there. We'll, we'll make improvements in both directions and we'll see problems as well. I, I think a bigger question for us as society is, this is just a really, really powerful tool and how best do we figure out, how do we manage that as a society? How do we put the right rules in place, potentially the right laws, which, which to restrict the right kind of things, uh, but also how do we use them? You know, What are the ethics that we live by in supporting these or not? Okay. I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, here is one interesting one, and uh, you know, which also uh, reflects the pain that uh, we as uh, people involved in this uh, field experience. Huge amount of, and this is from Rakesh, a huge amount of data is required for training most of the ML algorithms. Data collection for training itself is tedious, is a tedious job. Can you give any ideas to make this process simpler? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so <laughs> sadly, there's there's no magic there, and and people often don't realize that uh, there's a lot of pro like time and effort spent in creating that data. You know, we talked about I talked about those data sets, ImageNet or speech or or um, language. The researchers spend a lot of time really curating and cleaning up that data, and the same thing have works for most models that you see. Now, um, you know. It's not lost for every single thing though, depending on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to really use a, a do improvements or build a speech model or a vision model or a language model, which where you can leverage something that's trained on existing data, then in which you can often today, then those models are available today publicly already. And you can start there and just fine tune on a very small data set and still get lots of benefits. Of course, if you're doing this on, um, you know, say a database that you have and you want to train that on those, um, then you still have to clean up your data and manage that and stuff. Although of course, in that, but that particular case, what you're trying to do, you already have the data. It's not like you need to do a bit of manual and stuff. Now the good, the other good side of the labeling part is that itself is getting better. There are a lot more tools and companies that are helping make that better. So you hopefully will see that getting better. Okay, here's another one from uh, Srinath. Uh, despite the usage of many MLDL models by the top companies, the progress seems to be taking a long time to reach the typical enterprise though. Could you let us know how to bridge the gap between research and real products? I, I, absolutely. And, and that is something that I, I think is a big deal. And in fact, you know, the, this whole talk that I, you know, things that I talk about like TensorFlow Standard is really the goal is to simplify that. And this, we, this is something we saw at Google as well early on where early on the research teams would do that. And then some folks here and there who really understood the technology could leverage it. Uh, but as we started to build the pieces around the core model building itself, that started to help that. And I think we're making a lot of progress in that. The other one that came up earlier was, can we automate more of this? And we're starting to see tools uh, both in open source and by companies that are, that are helping those along. Uh, you know, some of the AutoML algorithms are available in open source with TensorFlow and other tools as well that you can start with, and also for some of the other pieces. And then there are products from companies uh, that try to solve that and automate that for you as well. So it's a combination of those. Uh, but yes, it's it's definitely slower than I would like. And I think there's there's a lot more that can be done in terms of those pieces. The other thing I expect to happen is, um, more of the areas or the applications themselves or the application makers will start to integrate ML and that's how you'll see more of the stuff happening in enterprise. <clears throat> okay, um, now Rajat, here's one question which uh, people keep asking uh, you know, us in classrooms and so on. Uh, do we really need to understand maths and statistics to do machine learning and AI? Uh, <laughs> so I, I think it's gotten to a point where the short answer is no, you don't need to understand everything to get started. I think you can apply AI in specific areas without necessarily understanding all the pieces. And that's okay. I, I don't think, I expect every engineer to learn all the details on day one. That said, if you wanna make a lot more improvements, if you really wanna push the state of the art, if you wanna do research, then absolutely you need to understand a lot more. I think the good thing with the tools, the existing models availability, et cetera, is, uh, has made so much progress that you really don't need to start by learning all the math. So that, that, that's definitely a good thing. I, I, I don't know if you would agree from a, a teacher <laughs> perspective where you do want people to learn that and there's value, but, but uh, 
at least people it's making it easier for people yeah i mean like you mentioned finally it depends on the on the goal right i mean so long as the tools are getting more sophisticated and uh, they are guaranteed to give you uh, maybe you know not the wrong solutions so they are fine i mean you can otherwise progress will never be made right okay here's a question from pranay um, and this one is very generic in the sense that will the ml automation on long term basis be hazardous for human beings looking at the machines becoming more and more intelligent on their own so are we really pushing the envelope too much um you know we think about this we this question comes up a lot but it turns out my personally i think it will eventually we will get there and we will have to grapple with those questions and so something that we shouldn't completely ignore but that said you know if i look at the progress we've made and where we are still there's still a long way to go in a number of directions both from the computation perspective from the algorithms perspective and all the pieces that we need to put together for machines to be really that smart where they can do things that you know we may not like so today yes they can do things that we may not like but they're usually going to be driven by some other human that's making that decision you know for example autonomous drones that kill somebody right so so, so it's still being driven by or directed by somebody It, you know the the things i worry more about is just simple things like automation you know just like automation in the past going from you know simple machines to computers or even uh, you know to an industrial age where instead of cows and farmers changing to tractors and you know larger scale things caused a lot of changes uh, ai and you know machine learning here has the potential and in fact it's already doing allowing us to automate a lot more things that humans do today now the good side of it is these are often very uh, routine tasks that these humans are not necessarily happy doing all the all the time uh, but that said if that's their livelihood and they have to rethink how they make money that is going to be a big change for them and how do we get through that that is a real challenge ahead of us very very soon and that's something that we should be thinking and spending more time you know worrying about thank you thank you rajat there are many more questions and you know more pertinently questions like how do i get hired by google i will let you write a, write a book on that i won't ask you that question <laughs> so since we also have come to the end of this uh, time slot i would like to thank you for your time and for uh, giving us a glimpse into the various technologies and also answering the questions about the present and the future thank you once again and uh, it was a pleasure uh, listening to you thank you it was a pleasure being here as well